You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome Welcome to to the the Advisor's Advisor's Option, Option. the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the The Advisor's advisor's option. Option. All right, everybody. That music means we are back once again for the Advisor's Option, the program here on the network for you, the busy financial advisor, asset manager, looking to maybe add some options into your clients' portfolios. Maybe you're already doing so, but you need a little guidance. Maybe you're a seasoned pro. You want to stay up on the latest and greatest in the world of options. Either way, we got you covered here on the Advisors Option. My name, of course, Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as from the ever scintillating, at least we tend to think so around these parts, Options Insider Radio Network. And, of course, for all of you out there looking for a little bit more education in your lives on the advisor side, make sure you subscribe to the full network. Shows like Options Bootcamp, Options Playbook Radio will serve you well Many hundreds of episodes waiting for you there. And then, of course, if you want to go above and beyond, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, the place to go for a lot of great additional content. Awesome pro Q&As. Have a great one coming up a little bit after this show today. So if you have more questions about the world of options and derivatives and volatility, that's the place to go, theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, the place to go to learn more. As we go to see who's joining us, on the old advisors option program today. First, let's go out to the sunny coastline. Yes, there is a coastline. It's small. Everyone forgets it. But there is a coastline of New Hampshire where we are joined once again by Mr. Matt Amberson, the founder over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services, a.k.a. the father of auto. (laughs) Mr. Matt, welcome back to the show, sir. (laughs) 
I'd like to see a DNA test on Otto, Mark. <laughs> you are denying paternity. <laughs> You're going to go on Mori Povich. I am not the dad. The am- smallest coastline yet, uh, and I'm looking at it, And but uh, uh, the biggest day of the summer is tomorrow, I would say, with earnings and the Fed and everything. So it's an opportune time, and we have one of the biggest names and options joining us too, Mark. We do. We are very excited to welcome back our old friend, Mr. Eric Cott, formerly holding court over there at the Options Industry Council. These days, we just call him the options man about town. Mr. Cott, welcome back to the Advisors Options, sir. It has been too long. Well, thank you, guys. I want to first say a shout out to that man up east, me being down in Florida, to the man up in New Hampshire. I think I'm correct to say it's 22 years that he has been uh, the ORAT's um god actually and uh and for and for you mr longo for a tremendous successful uh you know career with uh options inside of radio and i mean we go back probably decades plus but uh but gentlemen it's great to be back i guess the analogy that i'd say for you know being in chicago the birthplace of options is i'm sort of like michael jordan i took a little bit of a detour to go play baseball with the white Sox, <laughs> a little bit in the etf space but uh i'm back guys i'm reinventing myself and uh can't stay away from the derivatives uh mark and matt we don't talk about your time with the wizards and the white Sox. no no <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the bulls baby as we keep on rolling right on into the PL statement what the heck happened in the options markets since our last episode? Let's find out with the PL Statement. All right, everybody, welcome to the PL Statement, the segment born of the pandemic because you spend so much time at the top of every show trying to figure out what the hell just happened since our last show. <laughs> now it is a segment. We call it the PL Statement. Mr. Eric, you haven't been on with us in a little bit, so let's start with you. You've had quite the view of not just the option space, but indeed the entire financial markets, you know, ETF, stocks, all of the above, advisors, non-advisors, uh, since the last time we chatted. Of course, as we're kicking off the show here, we are seeing this color that everyone seems to have grown accustomed to this summer, which is green. A lot of green on the screen. Green yet again, which is interesting. We are heading into a big Fed announcement, so you might be expecting a little bit more circumspect action from the market right now, a little bit more reticence, a little bit more skittishness. Uh, We are seeing that reflected a little bit in the vol. VIX has remained firm this entire week, which is kind of what we anticipated. Hasn't really been able to break much below the 13 half level, trending right around 14 right now. So VIX showing us that there still is are still are some question marks lurking out there, including a very big one tomorrow. The broad market, not so much, just rally ho mode. But Mr. Eric, what's been catching your eye in this endless sea of green in the markets, endless sea of red in the vol space since the last time we chatted, sir? I'm glad you brought it up, Mark, because again, probably one of the times that the three of us had together uh pre COVID, I think back in first quarter of twenty twenty. That's when we saw VIX levels um, similar to what we're seeing right now. Um, you know, the SIPA vol index, you know, kind of falling back to that 13, 14 level. And, um, you know, look, Matt just said that we are going into tomorrow. It looks like a strong delta on a Fed rate hike, you know, inflation. Um, I'm sure, Mark, you and Matt went to go see the Barbie movie this weekend. Um, I haven't seen Oppenheimer. There's a lot I wore all my pink. With that. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. And then I'll make my analogy where the markets are sort of moving the ball, kicking it down the field towards the goal. Look, Messi just came here. We got Messi mania in Miami. We got soccer over there. But look, bringing it back to the advisor uh, mentality, um, maybe they have put sort of this um, potential recession on the back burner. Maybe there's some um, enthusiasm on the part of their clients. I do see um, more and more advisors actually who have gone out to see clients. I just spoke to one yesterday, a colleague of mine who did a road trip for a month going to see clients up east and traveling through the Midwest. So where there was some complacency towards the latter part of 2022, 2023 with all these Fed rate hikes and everybody's going to just batten down the hatches and go into their bunkers and see what happens in 2024, just like the heat that we're having around the world. And uh, Matt, you and Mark are experiencing, 
I guess, you know, Canadian wildfires, we have Saharan dust down here in Florida. I believe that the might be in a stage, and I'll let Matt enhance on this. Are we seeing a new definition of a bull cycle? I'll leave it at that. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the R word, recession. I was just listening to an interesting analysis by the journal over the weekend, and it explains why so many people are just so confused right now, because every traditional data point, not just the yield curve, but all of them you would look at that would traditionally be your indicator for a recession. They're all screaming recession right now, except the stock market. The stock market is the kind of the lone indicator that says, oh, you know, things are great. Uh, so you're right. It is an interesting time. You can certainly see why a lot of clients and certainly why a lot of advisors might be a little bit confused out there. But Mr. Matt, Eric raises an interesting point. We are in an interesting time. Maybe you're caught up in messy mania. I don't know. It hasn't really caught on here in Chicago. <laughs> but uh, what's catching your eye out there in these markets as we head into another Fed week, sir? Yeah, so um... – you tweeted what I said last month that we were strongly bullish, <clears throat> even though uh, the market valuation was pretty crazy back then. Uh, now it is insane. Uh, I mean, we have a trailing 12 month PE that is about 23. And in recessions, it should be. 15. So it, it is just beyond like the uh, in, you know, normal valuations of the market are just thrown out the window. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think all you could do is just kind of look at the volatility and, and directions. And, you know, we have a bunch of signals and they still and they're starting to the turn a little bit, though. You know, our contango is coming down. But I think a lot of that is because the Fed, you know, we just get we get some heightening front month volatility which is usually associated with a, a bear market, but you know they're just worried about what Powell is going to say and what's going to happen in the market. Uh, you know the vol the other things I look at are just these forward volatility relationships, which looks kind of neutral, and the market looks uh, the I'm sorry the implied volatility market looks you know pretty low and but you know. S- stabilizing it looks like it wants to go up and that would be bad for the market but you know we're we're not strongly bullish we're neutral now uh and these uh but this pe ratio but you know markets could remain irrational longer than you could remain solvent is what people have to always think you can't get in front of this bus until we start breaking down and and you know the first breakdown that happens is in the extremely liquid implied volatility market for all the options that are out there and you know like like they're still showing you know you know i would say neutral now which is getting a little weaker but you know i'm not going to step in front of it yet so it's a crazy market out there um you know there's there's uh you know we're still happy over that last month <laughs> you know i i as as you know i've i've uh, been calling uh 3000 before 5000 uh, but we're actually, you know, we're, we're getting up there, but I don't think we're going to get close. And to Eric's point, I don't think it's, you know, the entering of, of a lump prolonged bear market just because of, you know, you, you need to have some valuations. And these earnings that are going to be coming up, I think, you know, they're going to be guiding lower. You know, I, I think the first couple earnings seasons that we've had this, this year, they have guided lower, but people were worried about even worse. Now I think people are getting somewhat optimistic, which is bad for the market. I mean, everyone is so negative on the market, and that's, you know, Wall Street climbs a wall of worry type stuff. So I don't know. I mean, I I think we're getting long in the tooth, and um, I'm still holding to uh, uh, 3,000 before 5,000 mark, even though the the bet should be uh, it should be three to one in in my favor. Yeah. The stats are leaning in the other direction right now, sir. But yeah, three thousand. What if we get to forty nine ninety nine, and then it just all <laughs> falls out of bed? And you were completely correct. That far, but no farther, sir. But there you go, Liz. That might be an interesting poll. I actually, it probably wouldn't be an interesting poll because I'm sure ninety eight percent of people would say five thousand. But so understandably so. But <laughs> intriguing stuff. Maybe a potential flash poll. Down the road. Who knows? Let's see. Maybe maybe it'll be a flash poll during the show. We'll see. Maybe we'll get our producers to put it out there. Producers, well, let's do a short flash poll for the duration of the show, maybe an hour later. Do you agree with Matt? 3,000 before 5,000 in the SPX. Yes or no? As we keep on rolling, listeners, it is time to get the buzz. 
busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, as our producers get that flash poll up there, a good reason why you should be following us all the time throughout the week, listeners, at Options. You get all sorts of fun, not just show content and tweets, but also fun uh, questions of the week that you can engage with over there throughout the week. We have a fun one going on about crypto right now, which is interesting and quite contentious. But I'll leave that for our crypto rundown show. Instead, let's get to the buzz, of course, the portion of the show where we break down all the interesting developments and stories and trends that may have occurred in the world of options and derivatives since our last show. I get it. You folks are busy dealing with your clients. You don't have time to keep up with this stuff. That's what we're here for. And the ongoing saga that has been options volume listeners since beginning of 2020, when this whole madness kicked off from an options volume perspective, uh, the question has remained, can this possibly continue? And so far, the answer has been a resounding yes. Uh, I stopped fading it last year. I said, you know what? I faded it after 2020. I thought 2021, I thought there's no way we could do that again. Blew the doors off. 2022, I said, that's it. Uh, I washed my hands of this. I think I no longer fade the bull for options volume. That turned out to be another record year, over 10 billion contracts. And now coming into this year, we are on pace Yet again, I know Matt was uh, maybe feeling a little bit of uh, the bearish tip for volume out there, and that we have the numbers for June in about a week. We'll have the numbers for July, listeners. And again, this is summertime, so June and July, not traditionally banger periods for the options market, yet apparently no one told June this year, 962.6 million contracts going up in June, up nearly 20%. From the previous year, 19.4%. If you're wondering, what about total volume? How are we looking You know, year-to-date, all that stuff? Uh, the year-to-date average daily volume in June, or through June, I should say, was almost 45 million contracts. It's 44.7 million contracts going up every day in the options market listeners. That's up about almost 9%, 8.7% compared to the year before. So last year, a record year. The year before that, a record year. We are outpacing all of those yet again. So it seems like we are on pace for well north of the record. I believe it was 10.1 billion contracts that we hit last year. A couple of other highs, uh, index options volume up 38.1% year over year. I wonder how and why that could possibly be. <laughs> if you, Unless you've been under a rock, listeners, you know, the biggest story in the world of options for the last six months at least has been this explosion of zero-day contracts. Those are pretty much entirely in the index space, hence the continued resurgence of index options. So that does seem like that's giving a nice little boost to the overall options market right now from a volume perspective. Uh, Equity options, so single names, though, no slouch either, 23.3%. So a little bit of action there. So intriguing stuff. Uh, Mr. Eric, I know you've been busy being uh, the man about towns. You've been focused on a lot of things, ETFs and other things, not just options. But even though you've been gone, the train has continued chugging along down the track, sir. What are your thoughts on these nigh-on record numbers we're seeing pretty much month after month this year, sir? I give a lot of uh, credit to the, um, you know, the, the not only the education that continues through your outreach, Mark, through Matt, through others, the industry in general. I think the exchanges are doing a great job. My thought would be, and I kind of mentioned this uh, in the chat between us all, maybe we go to chat GPT and ask them and then ask your listeners, what do they think the volume will be at the end of 2023? I agree with both you guys. I didn't think you could surpass that, you know, eight, 10.1 billion, could be 12 billion. I mean, part of it comes in, Mark, you just alluded to it, is the zero dated options. The other thing is you have a lot of companies right now who are converting from these 40 act mutual funds into these defined outcome ETFs. It could be Allianz, you know, could be JP Morgan. You know, we look at Jeppy, we look at some of these massive, massive exchange traded fund um, overlay strategies along with, you know, again, the sell side really kind of embracing the zero dated options. I mean, Listen, Mark, Matt, you and I could go back not too long ago when we saw mini options be introduced, and that kind of fell by the wayside like the Yugo. So, I mean, obviously, zero-dated options were a demand. I mean, look, we go – we both – we all know this. I mean, SPX back to 1983, 
Um, you know, uh, there at SIBO, you've got SBXY and 05, you've got, you know, again, maybe there's innovations that we aren't aware of with AI. And I'm only throwing it out to your listeners. I mean, who knows what happens in the next five years with AI and the derivative space? We could have something very interesting, but my hunch would be this year with potential volatility in the fall, we always know what happens in September, October. Do we get it again in 2023? I do think that many asset managers, many advisors, along with their, um, you know, what they're recommending to their clients are going to be um, not complacent, but are going to be active and clearly harnessing, you know, the, uh, the option marketplace to either hedge or, again, have an opinion on potential upside after earnings. I think they're going to definitely gravitate towards it. So my, my, my thought would be that option volume is going to exceed, if not surpass, what we saw in 2022. Eric, you were around for some of those uh, early uh, OIC conferences a decade plus ago where the industry, SIBO and others, it was a big deal when when SIBO would agree to have the options industry conference. Let it be held anywhere near Las Vegas because – the connotation yes. of gambling was, was such a negative thing. They wanted to avoid it so steadfastly that they refused to go anywhere near Las Vegas. Now, fast forward to 2023, and now we have these contracts that many people are saying are pretty much akin to gambling out there. And not only are they full for it, but they're, they're listing more of them. They're listing zero-day effectively VIX, one-day VIX effectively out there. So they are really fully behind this trend. These are effectively quasi binaries at this point. It's fascinating. I, I don't know. Did you ever think back in those days, Eric, that we would be seeing such an embrace of these products on the exchange and institutional side? Mark, COVID kind of created this participation and you were ahead of the curve on that. I know Matt talked a lot about it a couple of years ago. Look, you had a lot of people that were at home that became quasi educated. You know, it's like, again, you don't learn chess from just watching people. Yeah, you can read a little bit, you have to participate. And I think that we saw with Robinhood and Webull um, and other firms bring in the masses to realize that using overlay strategies um, make a lot of sense. And, you know, we've talked about this on the show before where, you know, everybody sort of understands the idea of insurance and, and everybody understands the, AI, the concept of, you know, renting something out. And so when you, when you start to look at that, but the, I think the implosion, the parabolic implosion mark of, um, or, um, it, you know, just, just the, the, the activity, um, you know, in these, in these zero dated products is just, is, is astronomical. Um, and I think there's such a demand because we're in a global marketplace that, um, you know, it, it, it really sort of has opened up the door, um, you know, and I think to your uh, point, Mark, and my answer would be the exchanges have become um, more collaborative, but have also listened to their constituents, meaning the sell side, you know, the folks that are really kind of bringing the ideas. And it's nice to see these um, new enhancements and sort of um, new, um, you know, opportunities for retail, institutional and advisory to participate in it across the board. Well said, sir. Let's get out to uh, Mr. Matt. By the way, Mr. Matt, your flash poll is now live with the masses. It's a closer race than I thought it would be. I'll give you that, sir, in the opening blush here. Right now, it's 57.1% saying they don't agree with you and 42.9% <laughs> saying they do. It's closer to 50-50 than I thought. I thought you were going to get blown out of the water. I thought it was going to be 98% <laughs> saying they don't agree with you. So there you go, Mr. Matt. In the early voting. You're getting a little bit of love, even though one of our pro members here, Age Del Aquarius, tweeting in. By the way, this brand change on Twitter driving me crazy. I can't find anything. I'm not used to looking for a black X when I'm looking for Twitter, so I'm, I'm completely lost finding all this stuff. But here it is. Age Del Aquarius says, I'll listen tonight, but I don't, I don't agree at all. Definitely much more bullish now as long as the Fed can channel their inner Taylor Swift as they need to calm down. So I guess, I guess a big if, if the, if the Fed can rein it in, which the... The Fed Watch is not saying any chance of that tomorrow, Age. Uh, just ticked 50 50. So, Matt is much closer than I thought. So, does that surprise you? And then, what are your thoughts on this continued resurgence of the options volume bull, sir? I'm, I'm going to all my uh, computers to vote right now, Mark. Oh, that's what's going on. <laughs> now I see. <laughs> 
Um, and I'm still trying to get over uh, Eric Cott's, uh reference to the Yugo. I mean, that you know, this is what <laughs> that's worth the price of admission right there. That's why you bring him on the that, show. That's the kind of gold that, you get from the options man about town. <laughs> Yeah, back when my buddies, uh, that was the only car sponsor my buddies could get for volleyball. So they had a Yugo. So I've, I've driven any Yugo. So uh, and still, I'm still alive to talk about it. Um, yeah, I mean, be, as I was reading that, I'm just going to go, you know, that it's it, it it's such a stroke of genius, the zero DTE. And, you know, that's carrying it. And, uh, you know, I think it... it it is not just the zero DTEs, but all of that it leads to, because it leads to a lot more uh, trading. Of course, I'm a big proponent, and I uh, I don't agree with the, the, the naysayers that say it's um, just gambling. I don't agree with the naysayers that it's going to call a, a Volmageddon. Uh, ever since the beginning, I, I called for, you know, this is an important tool and it's important for finance. I mean, one of the reasons I got into options after graduating from graduate school in Chicago, uh, you know, was I think it's important and it is important to, to you know, uh, see what the risk is truly in the market. And, you know, you could do it with earnings for with adjusting straddles correctly. See, see what the uh, see what the implied move is uh, uh, on a on a particular stock, as Sosnoff said in a, in a uh, podcast last night. It's the most accurate volatility measure in that we have an option. So I thought that was interesting. But, you know, I think zero DTEs are, are extremely important. Um, and I, you know, I think there's going to be hourlies or at least middays or two hourlies. Um, you know, imagine, uh, you know, the Fed releases at 2, 2 p.m., um, you know, there's some volatility associated with that. But, you know, when Powell speaks at 2.30, there's even more volatility, some people say, with, with what he's saying. So that all can be measured with the with uh, implied volatility of the zero DTEs and, and, you know, doing that comparison that we do uh, uh, and to show what people are expecting. Um, you know, so all these are important, I think. And it's not just gambling. There's a lot that goes into um, the zero DTE is a lot of research. We're doing a lot of research here. So, um, you know, I think that's a lot where it's coming from. I think it's important. I think people are getting into it. Um, it allow the, the premiums are, are low enough in the SPX, for example, for, you know, normal traders to get in, retail traders could get in and, and, and try their lot. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, I've always been, you know, mild to put it lightly on, uh, on, the number of trading, uh, the number of trading contracts out there, but uh, you know, with this zero DT, it's really, really blown it up, and, and I, it, it's spilled over too. So I think that has a lot to do with everything, Mark. Yeah, it's fascinating how many voices have come out uh, again. Just this week, we had the folks from IB on our pro Q and A. They were dismissive of, of the zero day as gambling. Uh, Scott Nation is joining us on Ball Views later this week. He's been very outspoken about uh, about those products and <laughs> how akin to gambling they are. So interesting stuff. Speaking of interesting, right now, Matt, you are definitely gaming the system because it is exactly 50-50 in your poll right now. <laughs> there is no way that is natural voting. Uh, but we should... I only have one. I have had one vote. I'll, I'll admit one. <laughs> All your kids are voting. Eric's probably voting everybody. We'll see. But right now, I, I suspect skullduggery. Uh, if you're listening live, get in there. Defeat Matt Skullduggery listeners at options. It's only going to be going for another hour. So if you listen on the podcast, it will be too late, listeners, as we keep on rolling. Speaking of our listeners and your thoughts, uh, we had an interesting poll that is very appropriate for what we're talking about right now. The prospect of can this volume surge continue? We asked our audience. We asked our audience last week, actually, getting back to what Eric was saying about when VIX, last time VIX really hit 12 was back in January of 2020. We all know. What happened then? The last couple of times VIX has hit 12, it's been pretty bad for the world and indeed for the options market in particular. When VIX hit 12 back in 2017, it kicked off a very dark period for the options market. So we asked our audience, will we see a repeat this year with lower volatility leading to lower volume in the second half of 2023? We hit a 12, indeed an 11 handle in VIX this year, listeners. So we thought we'd ask you, is this low VIX going to kill volume for the second half of the year? Or will things like zero DTE come along and save us? And nearly 70%, 68.9% said, yes, low VIX is going to kill the volume trend. That kind of surprised me. Our audience looking a little bearish on volume there. And then 31.1% saying, no, zero DTE will come along to save us. So far, 
The numbers haven't borne that out. But again, we've got the second half of the year pretty much ahead of us here. Uh, so intriguing stuff. Eric, are you surprised that our audience was a little bit bearish on the prospects for this continued volume surge? And then B, one of the reasons we like having you on the show, I mean, we always like having you on the show for your nuggets like the Yugo, but also is because when you're not talking to us, you're hitting a variety of options and indeed financial-oriented events. So give us your event rundown of uh, interesting events maybe you've gone to or ones that are coming up. You think might interest our audience, sir. So a twofer. Yes, well... What I'll do is I'll kind of flip it on its side here and just uh, from the event side, you know, I've uh, things are back uh, in full force, sort of like people going to movie theaters. When I was talking about Oppenheimer, Barbie and some other things happening, it seems like the um, institutional um, community as well as the advisor community is is back in full force, uh, having kicked off the beginning of the year with, um, you know, the large, um, you know, exchange ETF event down in Miami. Um Matt and Mark and myself, we all know the guys uh, from, from RCM, you know, and, and such. And the, they're doing a lot of events with the exchanges, with NASDAQ and others. So a lot going on in the Florida area early uh, this year, along with, um, you know, uh, some other ETF conferences and then a uh, big Pershing. I'm headed out to California early in August for LPL, which is a very large conference. And uh, happy to report back on that to you, Mark, because we're getting more and more um, – advisory firms that offer these buffer strategies. And then you've got, you know, ETF firms, um, you know, again, talking about, uh, you know, JP Morgan and some others that uh, will be there speaking. So I think that, um, you know, uh, and maybe we'll touch on it a little later if we had time, Mark, to, you know, what Innovator's doing, you know, on sort of like this pseudo index based annuity, but now in an ETF, which offers this Huge principal protection, uh, having come from an insurance annuity background early on in my career. So it's interesting to see some of those innovations. Um, but uh, there's a lot more going on. One thing I will mention to your listening audience, because, Mark, I might have talked about this last year, but um, they they floated this conference called Future Proof, which uh, you know Josh Brown from CNBC, his partner Barry Ridholtz, uh, Ridholtz Wealth. They partnered with some folks, and they did this Coachella um, Burning Man type of conference for advisors, retail, and institutions out in California in Huntington Beach last uh, September. They're doing it again this year, and um, that is in September. I'm hoping to be there for their second annual, but that's kind of an interesting crypto derivative advisory. It's got a whole mix of that, but then they bring in musicians and such, and so uh, some of the famous rap bands from the 80s, I bet Matt knows these guys, Red Man and, or Method Man and Red Man or someone, I can't, I can't remember. I'm such a, my daughter would hate me because she's a musician and my future son-in-law. I can't remember the name of these artists, but they're going to be there. But those are touching on some of the interesting things. And then Schwab will be back in Philadelphia for the first time in a long time because Mark, Labor Day is when TD Ameritrade and Schwab are merging the two firms officially. So a lot to come out in the fall about what's going to happen to one of the largest RAA firms as they merge the old green into what they call the Schwab blue. So it'll be interesting in November when they have their event um, in Philadelphia. You had me till you said Burning Man for advisors, then you lost me. <laughs> I don't know if I want to be out in the, the desert dancing around the bonfire with a bunch of advisors. But outside of that, it sounds like an intriguing type thing going on out there as we keep on rolling. You know what always is intriguing, listeners? It's the earnings volatility report, so let's get to it. Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the Earnings Volatility Report. All right, everybody, welcome to the Earnings Volatility Report, the portion of the show, again, kind of born out of the pandemic. We saw earnings volatility kind of get annihilated, to put it mildly, in the early days of the pandemic. No one really cared about what these names were saying. They were just crushing the vol across the board. Of course, we had been crunching earnings vol before that, so we have a little bit of a track record going back now, a little bit of a baseline for which to compare to. And now, of course, so where we are in 2023, call it what you will, post-pandemic, whatever you want to call it out here right now, we have seen earnings vol make a resurgence. In fact, our long-term average now has ticked back up from the uh, low 80s, high 70s into about 98%. So effectively saying 
we're seeing almost as much movement as is being priced in by the straddles right now, which is kind of interesting. And again, was not the case not too long ago. So intriguing stuff. Mr. Matt, we have good timing because we are in it right now. Earnings season has really kicked off in full force this week. We got some big names popping off this week. More to come in the coming weeks. So earnings are flying fast and furious. You guys and the folks over there at Orats crunching all the numbers, sir. What are your thoughts, if you have any remaining, on the, the tail end of last season, what we saw there? And then what are you seeing? Any surprises? And what are your expectations for this season, sir? Yeah, um, you're correct. We've been watching this closely for, you know, quite a few years now. And, um, you know, we, tr- we track the trailing historical average of 12 quarters. And that average... Um, now, some of the COVID earnings are coming off. COVID w- w- was not kind, as you well recall, to the earnings returns on the straddle. Um, and so those came off, and, and we had some um, you know, pretty volatile last uh, quarters. And, and so, yeah, you're right. So the, the, the straddle um, is, is up near fairly priced, meaning you're returning as much when you're owning it as um, – but equals what you would get for selling it, and so it's moving what what's expected. Um, you know, these the the first week we had sixty eight reporters, and um, you know what's what we're seeing this this uh, season. You know, generally is following the VIX. I mean, the implied moves are a lot lower than than normal. Um, you know, you know, a good half a point, which is doesn't sound like a lot. That's like ten percent lower than. Than normal, so um, you know, and it beat. I mean, first week we usually see, you know, we we look at these um, we look at these earnings, and and we we saw you know a lot of beats uh, the first week, and it's about break even this week. Um, and let's see, yesterday came out and hot off the press. Uh, let's see, RTX <laughs> was down fifteen percent. Uh, that normally moves only around 2.7 percent. Uh, Logi was up uh, 10 percent. 3M was up 5 percent versus 4.2 percent. Um, and you know, but I'd say overall it was about uh, you know break even, slightly less than break even day. Uh, Spotify moved 5 percent more than normal um, yesterday. But you know, the the big the big weeks coming up. Um, you know, we have Microsoft um, and I was interested in Microsoft. I looked at it. I go, is that right? Um, so Microsoft's trading 345. The straddle, uh, what we figure out what, what the stock's going to move around that straddle. And we have a special way to do it. You have to look at how many days are left and, and interpret, um, you know, what the normal moves would be in, at uh, earnings and then figure out what the uh, cost of the straddle should be. And then net that out. So we think it's going to move eighteen point four dollars, which is a lot, considering that the past earnings move uh, only imply about thirteen dollars of movement. So uh, Microsoft's way up there, um, and we're seeing some other stocks, Google included, that that are greater now than uh, than the past earnings move. So I think they're adjusting. I think the market has adjusted a bit. Uh, to um, you know, a, a too low of an estimate the 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 first week. Now they're coming back up, and I think this is going to be a, a you know a very important week. Um, and in the next week, you know, usually what we'll see is that the straddle owners don't do that well the first couple of weeks, and then they do well in weeks three and four. But I think with this uh, you know adjustment, you know, they're probably going to see. Uh, maybe a break even this week, and then. But I think next week, you know, again, I'm 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 in the camp that the, um, you know these earnings they can't keep pushing off the reality, and people are going to start to price this market um, a lot differently uh, when you know when the reality of, of earnings comes because you know a 23 trailing PE is is an, I don't think sustainable, especially given the higher interest rate environment. So that's how I'm looking at the entire thing, Mark. Fascinating stuff, listeners. Of course, if you want to check out that data for yourselves, theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the Options News and Articles tab to begin your journey down the dark side of earnings volatility. Just be warned. 
it's a lot of great, compelling data. You're going to want to keep clicking. <laughs> so you're going to go down a rabbit hole. But it's a fun, informative rabbit hole. As we keep on rolling, we got some time left. So let's squeeze in a little bit of the old Options 101. Earnings announcements can move markets, but what is the options market telling us about upcoming earnings events? Let's find out with the Earnings Volatility Report. All right. Welcome to Options 101, the portion of the show we break down what is typically a basic option strategy or technique and explain how you can utilize it in your clients' portfolios. Going to go a little bit more advanced today. I would consider time spreads and calendars more of a 201 maybe a 301. These are definitely kind of where the rubber meets the road for a lot of uh, options traders out there in terms of testing their knowledge. It's an intriguing time to be considering calendars. We are in a very low vol environment. Let's set the table right now really quickly, a quick example of your traditional use case that you may have heard of or encountered or seen people talking about with calendars. Then we'll get to some of the ways that you may want to tweak it for this low vol environment, including to the put side, which is intriguing. Uh, But your traditional use case, let's say XYZ hanging out around 20 bucks. You're looking at XYZ, you think maybe it might be moving down the road, but not going to do too much right now. So you say, you know what, I'm going to go, I'm going to buy a calendar spread, a time spread. What that traditionally involves listeners, it's usually on the call side, but as you'll see in a minute, you can do it on the put side as well. And so let's say in our example, you buy the XYZ two month out at the money call. In our example, that costs you $2. And then you turn around and say, it's not going to move much for the next month. I'm going to sell this one month at the money call against it. And in our example, you get a buck. So you cut half your outlay off the top right there. So your net outlay, your net risk on this trade is $1. And, of course, now you have a bunch of choices you can make along the way. Once you get to that first month's expiration, if that call expires worthless, you can decide, hey, I've got this now call that I bought that should have cost $2. Actually, only it cost me one. So do you let that ride? Do you take it off? Do you roll it? Do you adjust it? There's a lot of things you can do with the calendar because there are multiple moving parts to it. But that is the traditional setup for a calendar. I say that, Matt, to kind of lay the groundwork because I know you you have some tweaks you want to propose to our audience for this low vol environment. So have at it, sir. The floor is yours. Yeah, you know, calendars, we were talking about it today. We have a trading club meeting at, at ORATS, and we were talking about how how calendars are underappreciated, we think. Um, we, you know, at ORATS, we have a new uh, backtest uh, platform where we're pre-running, you know, millions. I think we're going to get into the billions of, of backtests there. And we're just concluding uh, calendars, and they're looking really good, especially from a margin requirement. You know, the margin in a you know in your example here is only a dollar, and it's often you know four to one um, payoff, you know, risk reward type thing. So what you'll see is you know the sharp ratios will be okay, but uh, you know if you look at uh, the the ratio uh, of the volatility when the stock is going down, the volatility is a lot lower. So, uh, you know, even though uh, the sharp is relatively high or re- relatively normal, um, what you'll see is, uh, and I'm just pulling one up here, just to, uh, that the Sortino ratio. Um, the Sortino ratio differs from the Sharp ratio in that in the denominator is the volatility when the when the uh, strategy is has gone down. So um, you know people will look at the Sortino and say, you know, I don't really care what the volatility is when I'm making money. I want to see what the volatility is when I'm losing money. Well, the calendars lose money very slowly, so the Sortinos are going to be really good, and they don't need that much margin since you know your outlay is only what you uh what you have paid for the the calendar since you're buying you know normally the same strike out farther you're going to be you know long premium even though the theta will be in your favor since that front month generally uh decays faster so you'll be in a situation where you'll be long theta so favorable theta long (laughs) vega and that's why I said, you know, during these low ball environments, it's a it's a decent way to go. Um, and then, you know, the people that look at Sortino ratios are happy. To, you know, if you look at annual margin returns and Sortino ratios, 
it's a very good strategy. You know, it just doesn't make a lot of money one by one, but what you got to, you know, but you could also afford to, you know, put on a higher quantity of the strategy. So um, I've been a, I've been a, a big fan of, of the calendars, especially in this type of environment where you could get long uh, this market that you might not like for not too much money. And, you know, our back test, just to, to speak to, to what you were saying before, our strategy is just, you know, when you get out, you don't want to have a long call. You just you uh, just start over with the strategy. Um, and we've we've run a, a ton of these strategies. And like I said, it they come out, you know, very good from a margin perspective. You don't lose a lot if it goes against you, if the market goes against you. But you have a chance, you know, for example, some of these, you know, 14 delta uh, 16 deltas that we're testing, um, you might only win 37% of the time, I think is, is about average for those. Um, but your risk reward ratio is, you know, four to one. So that's a 25%. So you need to win at least 25 and 37 is above 25. So they, they come out ahead. So, um, you know, we're, we're fans of the, uh, of the calendars. Now, it's a, it's a little bit intuitive. What, what we also have is, you know, we could run and test these calendars in different IV percentile, high, medium, and low. We we test for. You'd think low would be the best, but actually low is is uh, second best, maybe third best. High is actually pretty good because you get these kind of violent up moves, and which is great for some of these out of the money calendars. So if you want, if we own a calendar, you want it to go to the strike that you're long or the strike that you've traded and you know basically expire there because the the front month expires basically worthless and that's the highest that you can get the back month for, while the front month expires work worthless so you want to pick a, an area uh, for that strike where you expect the, the the stock to go and some people put on you know so some people put on a, a call an out of the money call and out of the money put so you kind of make a tent if you if you think about uh, a payoff picture it makes a circus tent with two uh, two poles I, I should say and so it's almost like being you know long gamma even though you're long theta so um, in this type of a grinding type of a market where it's not too volatile, uh, you know, calendars can can be quite productive. Uh, it could also, you know, if you don't like the market, like I don't like the market, but our signals are strong, you, you can get long without spending too much money. So I have, um, you know, and, and you can protect your uh, portfolio to the downside, you know, by buying calendars. It really reduces the cost of, of puts if you if you do a calendar and it goes all the way down towards your calendar. If it goes, if it blows through it, then you don't lose the protection. But usually, you know, you'll have time to either get out of the calendar or, um, you know, it'll it won't get quite that far. So th that's my uh, that's my take from uh, you know the billion tests that we have been doing over at ORAS Mark. <laughs> if anything confuse you, there, listeners? Of course, pause it. Go back. That's the magic of podcasts at the end of the day. And of course, we have a lot of great content explaining calendars in a lot more detail on Options Bootcamp. Options Playbook Radio. We have touched on them on this show once or twice in the past as well. Mr. Eric, anything to add there on the world of calendars and these types of strategies that you could utilize with maybe a nominal outlay to participate in the market you may otherwise be skittish of, sir? I love the fact that uh, our man from New Hampshire, who's probably doing this in a tent right now outside his house, looking at that beautiful <laughs> shore. I love that tent analogy. It's like, you know, protecting yourself from those uh, horrific rainstorms that they've had up there. And, uh, you know, kind of uh, in, a, in a very, you know, the market right now is in that 55 mile an hour middle lane right now. You know, it's if in a neutral place right now, I think advisors should really be looking at this as well as. Um, retail investors, and um, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, the guy in New Hampshire. I think Orats does unbelievable deep dive research and really kind of gives you the tools necessary to look at some of those underlyings that you could be uh, considering, you know, for these calendar, you know, debit spreads. I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's another differentiator right now where everybody's like, hey, we're just, you know, we're just going long. Or we're just buying calls here right now with the potential of certain industries are going to, you know, move like, you know, again, I heard a lot of this buzz from, you know, folks who were, you know, just buying calls on bank stocks. And we had all this, you know, um, concern going on 
you know, with First Republic and all that, you know, a number of months ago. And then you had situations happening with Schwab and, you know, uh, people pulling money out. So I think, you know, right now, um, I like the idea that Mark's, uh, you know, that Matt's bringing this up. Sure. I think that people should consider it. And we always consider you folks. So we'll squeeze in a real quick office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on the optionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at the optionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody, let's get to it because we're kind of running out of time. Let's go to this question from Miami RIA. I wonder what he or she does. <laughs> they say, I can report I've seen an uptick in client inquiries about options over the past year. We're glad to hear that, Miami RIA. Uh, they go on to write, most of them have settled in on the covered call as their preferred vector of attack. But I also have a few dabbling in long call spreads. I can't imagine that I'm alone in this regard. Are you seeing an uptick from other advisors with regard to client interest in options? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, we haven't seen a new one of those uh, advisor surveys from our friends over there at OIC. I'll have to put that to them again, see if they can go out and kind of survey the market, because that's the best source of data for this stuff. I mean, obviously, anecdotally, we can look at things like overall volume and volume in a lot of the strategies you talk about and see a huge uptick there. So we can anecdotally assume more advisors are using these things. But until we have the studies in our hot little hands, it's hard to say what percentage increase we are seeing out there. That said, Mr. Eric, you are the options man about town. You are always going hither and yon to different events and conferences and talking with advisors and not just the options folks. You're not just preaching to the choir. You're talking to the stock folks and the ETF folks. You know, when you're talking to those folks outside of the bubble, shall we say, what are you hearing from an options perspective? Are they options curious, shall we say, or are they maybe a little bit spooked? What are you hearing? What are you seeing out there? I would say their option interest, and I'm going to definitely take a litmus test next month in San Diego, Mark, um, you know, from LPL, because they've actually um, acquired other um, firms. As you know, there's a lot of folks that in the prior Brokers Express that ended up going to LPL. So um, they're they're option centric, those folks. But, you know, I mean, I I think overall, um, you know, that that there is an interest, as we've always said on this program, and the three of us have talked about this as well, advisors tend to do this for themselves. They can, they're more concerned about doing it with their clients. And then at the firm they're at, are they allowing them to do, say, multi-leg, like we just you know talked about calendar spreads, things like that. I, but I think there is um, you know, a, an interest in it. I think it's a great question from Miami RIA, um, certainly on the covered call side. But um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's important to get deep in the weeds and try to hear what folks are saying. So, um, you know, I'm going to put my little reporter hat on and uh, and come back with some uh, some recognizance. All right. Next time we chat with you, we want hard data, sir, from data. the options man about town. Speaking of hard data, Mr. Matt, you're full of hard data. You're always talking to different RIAs when you're not out there running myriad back tests on put calendar spreads. Uh, what are you hearing and seeing out there from the RIA space? Are they more intrigued? Are they options curious, for lack of a better word? Yeah, I would say that it's more on the downside uh, that we're talking to uh, these uh, these RIAs, uh, protecting portfolios. How, what's the best way to do that? It's still somewhat expensive, even though the skew, meaning the puts versus the calls, have come down. So the, the, and also the volatility is lower, so it's cheaper, but. You know, it, it, as the market just climbs, I mean, you're 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 losing a lot of that premium. Again, we we like to talk about that put calendar because you got that front month uh, and the back month, and the front month is decaying faster. Um, however, you know, the delta is not as good, but still, you have some delta to, to protect you uh, in that. So th- those are the things that that we're seeing. You know, I, I've I'm, I'm not that. A big of a fan of the cover call, especially in these low ball environments. When we did a huge cover call strategy uh, back test, we found that 
the only time that it, it's it's really useful is when you could get a very good, very high return from the calls. Otherwise, um, it's really not worth the risk. So that's uh, that's kind of in a nutshell uh, how I feel about uh, those questions from the Miami RIA, Mark. The Miami RIA, indeed. Unfortunately, that music means. We've come to the end of another journey through the world of advisors and options. And Matt, I have a double dose of bad news for you. Not only is the show over, but our audience has spoken (laughs) and you are wrong, sir. 71.4% now do not agree with you. So they they overcame your skullduggery. They managed to overcome your little bit of uh, bamboozling behind the scenes now. It was 50-50 for a lot of the show. Then they finally, they finally, cooler heads prevailed. So 71.4% saying no, only 28.6% saying yes. So Matt, our audience has definitively spoken. You are wrong. What do you say, sir, to our audience? Well, as, as they know and you know, uh, the market is the only one that's going to tell me that I'm wrong. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I've, uh, I've kept that 71% of the people and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to them um, <laughs> when we're trading 3,000, Mark. You can look like a genius when it hits 49.99 and then falls out of bed. Take a screenshot of that and say, ha ha, nana nana boo boo to you. I told you so. <laughs> All right, Mr. Matt, if folks want to reach out to you, maybe the uh, the other 28% want to reach out to you and talk about some ORATS fun or anything else. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, ORATS.com. My email is Matt at ORATS. Reach out to me anytime. Uh, if you want to see that huge uh, back test finder that we've got going, um, it's still in, we're still running tests, so it's not totally done with all the, the base cases, but uh, we're growing, and there's some really interesting data coming out, out of that. And uh, you know, we have a, you know our platform now. We're, we're connecting with brokers, uh, and then we're moving more towards uh, automating and with. El- exit alerts so we're, we're making trading easier better with more research so uh come on over to orats and, and check it out mark i'm gonna come over there between the next show and, and check it out as well I, I need to do a deep dive into all things or i've been meaning to do that set aside a whole bunch of time i just haven't got i haven't had the time yet matt but i'm coming i'm coming i'm gonna do a deep dive in orats you folks can join me over there as well orats.com o-r-a-t-s.com the place to go to learn more of course give him a follow over there on Twitter at Option Rats. Tell him why he's wrong, why you disagree with him in our Twitter poll. I'm sorry, not Twitter, the X poll. Now, that's, I'm never going to say that. That's ridiculous. Uh, Mr. Eric, <laughs> what's cooking in the land of the options, man about town? What can folks look forward to coming from you? And maybe some folks are listening to this. They're in the RIA, the asset management space, and they're saying, you know what? I could use the expertise of said options man about town. How do they go about finding you, sir? They can find me, Mark, at uh, www.cotconsulting.com. That's C-O-T-T, my last name, consulting.com, or Eric at cotconsulting.com. I appreciate that shout-out from both of you guys. And, uh, again, I think the discussion here about uh, trying to find out what the DNA and the psychology of advisors and options is is um, there's a, a desire for it and a need, and I think uh, we might be looking down that road. Eric can also be found on X as well. He's at Eric Cott, all one word out there. <laughs> you have to get the Twitter fired up again, sir. Yes. Got to yes. start tweeting. I'm sorry, X, are you going to call it Xing now? Are you supposed to call it Xing? This whole thing is, 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 is idiotic. <laughs> it sounds terrible. I'm Xing. <laughs> this, there you go, listeners. Give him a follow while you're at it as well, at Eric Cott, E R I C. And then C-O-T-T, all one word. That's going to do it for us here on the Advisors Options. Not going to do it for us on the network today, though. We're going to take a little bit of a break. We'll be back in about an hour for all you pro folks with the pro Q&A. Our good buddy, Mr. Jim Carroll from Toroso Advisors, is going to get deep into the world of volatility, all sorts of fun. So if you got your questions for that, get them in now. If you're not part of the pro, what are you doing? Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro, the place to go. You get to join all these fun parties and so much more over there. And then back again with our usual array of content throughout the rest of the month until our next episode of the Advisor's Option. Stay safe out there, everybody.
Advisors Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development, making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs> 